Gene Pitney, a singer and songwriter, he wrote for other artists too, had great hits like Town Without Pity, 24 Hours from Tulsa, and It Hurts to Be in Love. Gene Pitney came to Vancouver during Expo 86, where we talked to him. The legendary Gene Pitney. You know, reading your bio, you were born in Hartford, Connecticut, but raised in Rockville. Couldn't you imagine that as a Gene as a title for an album, Raised in Rockville? Well, they hung me with that red, right, right in the beginning. Somebody on uh, one of the radio stations from Hartford called me the Rockville Rocket. And to this day, I'm in graying hair and all, I'm still referred to as the Rockville Rocket at home. What do you think, Gene, of uh, the reunion of rock and roll, the revival of rock and roll? I hate the word revival. It sounds like it died. It never did. But all of the attention, performers like yourself and Roy Orbison and uh, all of the acts that uh, were so big in the 60s, is it that the kids today are without their own brand of music or what? But it's so phenomenal. Well, it's an amazing thing to me because I didn't realize until, well, not a year ago, I thought that like when the 50,000 watt station in, in Hartford yeah. went 50s, 60s music, I thought it was a localized situation. I didn't know that it was a program thing all the way across the country. And I noticed when I just recently did, did a, cour, a tour of Ontario that it's in Canada and it's pretty much around the world because uh, I've been doing tours nonstop for like 26 years. So uh, so has Roy, so has a lot of the people that you mentioned. Right. Uh, for me, this happening is, isn't like, matter of fact, the tour that I'm on right now has nothing to do with the fact of, of that happening. It's, it's beneficial. But I have people that like write into the fan club and they say, uh, I remember one girl, she was like 17, and she said, I wish I lived in the 60s. And I have to ask people because it fascinates me why. And you come to a conclusion after a while that there was like, the only word I can come up with is optimism. Yes. There was definitely an optimism and a, a feeling of... Uh, that if everybody did something together, they could create something. It was a thing, of, peace was a big part of it. Uh, John Kennedy was a big part of it. Um, positive thinking, positive lyrics in all the songs. And it was a very, very up time. And to me, the 70s was a complete loser, a complete washout. So, I mean, I don't know whether there's any songs anybody's going to relate back to from the, from the 70s, but it's all of a sudden come full circle again. He's a rebel with the crystals, you wrote that. Uh, rubber ball for Bobby V. Um, today's Teardrops, which Roy Orbison did on the other side of one of his giant hits called Blue Angel, and Hello, Mary Lou for Rick Nelson. And was it a situation like Neil Diamond had? Because I've talked to him. You know, he said he was writing all of this, and then he realized that maybe he couldn't be as good or better than some of the artists, but he's, he thought uh, the way to get his songs out was to sing them himself. I mean, that was his motivation. It was absolutely a side door situation for me. There were people, uh, A&R men, that listened to the sound that I have, that high-pitched sound. And I could tell when they were listening to me play piano or guitar that they were saying, is that sound something good? Is it marketable? Will people want to buy it? Or is it going to be a turnoff as far as people? And you, you go back to Neil for a moment. I remember Neil coming around as a songwriter and uh, coming in, sitting down, playing things on the piano. And it's so relative, because I remember the same thing with Backrack and David when they first started writing. Their time had to come where their sound was acceptable. Right. Neil was doing the uh, Cracklin' Rosies and things like that. Sweet Caroline, I think. Uh, yeah, which it just wasn't ready for, for somebody else to record it. I don't know why, but the music at that time, the trend or whatever was happening in the day, you know, go back into the late uh, 70s, like with disco or something, where it flooded the market. So if you heard anything else, you'd say, well, it's not, not right for now. But his time had to come, and when it did, of course, bingo, they found out the best guy to record his song was himself. And Burton and Howell, when they were writing, they were writing for a long, long time with a certain type of a, a sound that um, really almost like after Alfie from the movie, then they came into their own. But they'd been around having a hit here and there with R&B stuff and different kinds of songs for a long time, but that not, not until the time arrived. But how did you feel when, uh, for instance, with Rick Nelson's Hello, Mary Lou or Today's Teardrops, which he did and, and Roy Orbison did, was that a flattering thing? I mean, it's like uh, you've, you've done a painting and someone has admired it who's also an artist. How, how My did... favorite part of songwriting. Is like the fact that you create it. It's kind of like your baby. And especially if you're writing on your own and you do the uh, lyric uh, and the melody. And then I used to love to have somebody take it and do something with it that was totally different. Produce it a way that you hadn't had in mind whatsoever. Like if uh, Hello Mary Lou, for instance, I never in a million years would have pictured Rick Nelson being the guy for that record. Now people will say, how can you say that? Because yeah. when they first heard it, they heard it probably with Rick Nelson singing it, which is automatic. So you relate the two together. But I sat in my little 35 Ford coupe with my guitar strumming, and uh, I had that phrase in my head, Hello, Mary Lou, Goodbye, Heart. And I just knew that if I could wrap the song around it, that I, I had a winner. And then 
every time that I had a good song that I wrote, the reason I never got to record them was that I had a song out as a recording artist. So when my song was out there, my publisher being very, very aggressive said, well, I got a good song. I'm not going to wait for him mm -hmm. by the time his song gets, goes down the charts. So bingo, somebody else had it. Talking to Bobby V last year, and, uh, and he mentioned that Rubber Ball was really the first giant that he had. He had records out before that, Devil or Angel and things. But uh, right. you didn't have him in mind for it either, obviously, when you wrote it. Or did you? I'm not sure with that one. The only one that I ever wrote for that I said I'm going to actually get them to, to record, yeah. I, want, I want to have their follow-up record, was He's a Rebel. Because I had heard um, what Phil Spector had done with Uptown. And it was the first time I'd ever heard a complete string section written for a funky song, like an R&B or a, a, actually a rock way. And I, I was parked in front of the Connecticut Bank and Trust building. I remember exactly where I heard it on the radio. <laughs> and it made such an impressive impression on me that I said I'm going to write the next single for them. And never thinking in a million years that I could, but I did. But as far as uh, Rubber Ball sounds, maybe like there was some connection because it was it's right up his alley. I mean, yeah, it was the right kind Buddy of Buddy Holly-ish type mm. sound, you know. And when I heard it, I remember telling the publisher, I said, that's going to be your first first big hit by me as a songwriter. Because I had that that listener's ear, which you, you wear, out, wear out after a while. When mm -hmm. you start writing and you get clinical and you start listening to the arrangement and you start listening to different parts of the song, you don't take the whole thing and encompass it and just say that's a hit or that's not a hit. And I'm too close to it. Yeah. yeah, and at that time I still had it. I heard one play on it and I said, bingo, winner. But I remember you being interviewed, I don't know who did it, years and years ago, when you did uh, Town Without Pity, which won a Golden Globe Award, uh, was nominated for an Oscar. I think you sang, sang that on the Oscars that year. Scared you? me to death, yes. What was that like, working with uh, somebody like Dimitri Tiomkin? Uh, well, it was a funny session because when they, uh, the reason I got the song to begin with, it was political. Uh, I, happened, I was on Music Core Records, which was distributed by United Artists Records. The film was produced by United Artists. And uh, the, the guy managing me said, you know, can we get Gene to do a song from a movie? And they came up with that one. And I went out to L.A. and I, I got the song, and it was a very unusual song. I mean, it still is today, but it was very unusual for that period of time. And I thought, how do I sing this thing? Yeah. What do I do with it to make it successful? Like, well, how am I supposed to approach it? And I thought the best thing I can do is just go in and sing it as straight a ballad and as straight voiced as I possibly can, as round voiced as I can. And I remember we started at 7 o'clock at night. And as the night progressed, I could see in the booth, Tiomkin was there, and Aaron Schroeder was doing the production, Jimmy Haskell was uh, with the stick, and Don Costley had written all the arrangements. And they were all kind of like looking at each other and saying, eh, you know, it's all right. Let's try it again and we'll do something different. They were changing the orchestra, changing the girls and the group in the back singing and everything. And I could tell that nothing's really happening. 3.30, 4 o'clock the next morning, <laughs> I was running out of pipes. And instead of going, what a town without pity, I was going, what a town with... And they said, that's it. That's it, what we're looking for. the growl in the voice. Yeah, as they called it, a greps is what they wanted. <laughs> You've recorded in Italian, in Spanish. At one time in history, without getting into all the details, uh, I think you had uh, the country album on the charts, uh, Italian hits. Uh, I mean, you were on the charts all over the world, sometimes in different languages. Uh, that must have been an incredible time for you, personally. It was incredible, incredibly successful, but I didn't realize what a, a difficulty that makes for you uh, when you do that, because you, you think of the uh, challenge of going after having success in one of the, any one of those fields, and it's terrific. But once you do have it, like take, for instance, uh, Italy, which became very, very, very big for me. Once you have success in Italian, in the Italian language, that meant one more whole new set of songs that I had to go after right. for the next LP and for the next single. When I went to the country field, okay, now you've got to have all new, it's got to be country and western stuff, it's got to fit the field that you're going into. So it just made it like a 12-month year was, was impossible. It was really like an 18-month year that was needed. To conclude all this, Gene, one of the things that's fascinated me about, uh, about your career, and I'm a big fan of Gene Pitney, you know Thank that. Thank you. And I remember we did a show here in Vancouver with the Chiffons and a whole bunch of people back in 63 or 64. But at a certain period in your career, you did something that I really admire. I think you've, you know what I'm talking about. You gave up the road and all of that to, to be with your wife and raise your kids. And do you regret that? Oh, it was the biggest benefit thing I ever did for myself, and I didn't realize it at the time. It was right in the early 70s, and I was traveling like 11 months out of the year. My oldest two boys were one and two, two and three, whatever at the time. And it was like a, a guilt situation where I just said, uh, it's, it's wrong. And uh, I see too many what I call absentee daddies all yeah. the time. And I 
vowed to try to go cut back to six months out of the year. Not knowing that by, well, by doing that, first of all, I knew I was going to lose the recording side. Right. Because I used to spend three or four months just looking for material. And I also had to pick and choose where I was going to go. And as a result, kind of like lost my own backyard for the market in, in North America. But I didn't know that uh, anybody in any job, that if you keep pursuing something, if you work at it as hard as I do when I go into something, if you keep at it all the time, it erodes. You're working just as hard, but you're 100% cuts down to 90% and you think your output's the same and you're doing things just as good. Well, my benefit from the whole thing was that when I got away from it and forced myself to take a couple months off, and then I went back out and did another a live show, oh, the enthusiasm and, and the feel. you were fresh again. Oh, yeah, for being out there. I mean, that's the way you got to do it. Well, how old are Chris, David, and Todd now? David is the little guy. He's only yeah. eight. But uh, Todd is now 19. Yeah. Chris is 18. They're both in college. And... Uh, Everything is much more settled. I spend more time on the road now than I did before. Right. Uh, it's a whole different way of life. But I didn't realize that by doing that, that's the beauty of it, that uh, the benefit was, was coming my way as well. Gene, good luck with all of your shows and your career. You're one of the great originals of American music, and thank you for talking with thank us. Thank you, Red. My pleasure. Thank you. See you again. Thank you, my friend.